Good morning. The first lesson of today comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, started at verse 9. As I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousands served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood attending him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient One and, pre and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. Our psalm today is Psalm 93 and should be re read responsively. The Lord is king. He has put on splendid apparel. The Lord has put on his apparel and girded himself with strength. He has made the whole world so sure that it cannot be moved. Ever since the world began, your throne has been established. You are from everlasting. Mightier than the sound of many waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, mightier is the Lord who dwells on high. The second lesson comes from the book of Revelations, chapter 1, verse 4. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This ends this morning's lesson. If you are able, please rise for the reading of the Gospel. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask me this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth 
listens to my voice. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Congregation may be seated. I'll invite the children down for a moment. All right, good morning, my young friends. How are you all today? I'm good. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks again. I'm doing well. Um, Way back when I was in middle school, back in the 90s, uh, there was a movie that came out. You probably never heard of it. Um, it was loosely based on this play called Hamlet by this guy called Bill Shakespeare. And the movie was called The Lion King. <laughs> you ever seen that one? All right. So you remember the story that Simba is the son of the king? And you know, you've, you've seen The Lion King before. But uh, what I was thinking about this past week is uh, there's this great song in the movie where Simba sings, I just can't wait to be king. I'm not sure if you remember that song. Uh, I won't sing it now. My voice is a little raspy today. <laughs> but he just can't wait to be king. That's, that's the song he sings. And his imagination is thinking, well, when I get to be king, I'll get to play all day long. I'll get to go wherever I want. And no one will tell me what to do. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And then later in life, Simba finds out that being the king is a big responsibility. And that he finds out that it's his job to do what? Do you remember? Yeah, he's in charge, exactly. But really, he has to like protect the people, protect the, not shouldn't say people, but the animals, <laughs> protect the kingdom and to serve them. Because there's a time he goes away and his uncle is a very bad king sort of ruins the whole kingdom. And that's when Simba learns that being a king is about being a servant of others. So today, on this day, Christ the King Sunday, you know, we talk about how Jesus is our king. Uh, and that's something we rejoice in because it's, we remember that not only is he the almighty, everlasting, all-powerful God, but he also came as someone to serve um, and he washed the feet of the disciples and, you know, did all kinds of things to show people and to show people God's love by, by serving them. So I think that's a good example for us to remember that really being great and being an important person often sometimes means being a great servant and, and caring for those that other people often overlook. So let's say a quick prayer together, okay? Um, dear God, I thank you so much for Molly and Ryan and Nathan and all of our children here at Good Shepherd. Um, we pray, Lord, that you will help us to follow the example of Jesus, our King, who loved and served all people. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. All right, hey, thanks so much. <laughs> you can go back to your seat, Nathan. <clears throat> All you high school students read Hamlet, right? No? Not yet? What are they teaching these kids these days, huh? <laughs> Just kidding. <clears throat> Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Christ the King Sunday is a relatively new observance, while many of our Christian practices and traditions go back a thousand or even two thousand years, Christ the King Sunday was established only in 1925 by Pope Pius XI. He did this in response to the growing secularism and nationalism of the day. His hope was that Christians all around the world would find unity in the Lordship of Christ rather than be divided by country, creed, culture, or race. Pope Pius wrote, if Christ our Lord is given all power in heaven and on earth, if all people purchased by his precious blood 
are by a new right subjected to Christ's dominion. If this power embraces all people, it must be clear that not one of our faculties is exempt from his empire. Christ must reign in our minds, which should assent with perfect submission and firm belief to revealed truths to the doctrines of Christ. He must also reign in our wills, which should obey the laws and precepts of God. He must reign in our hearts, which should spurn natural desires and love God above all things and cleave to him alone. He must reign in our bodies, which should serve as instruments for the interior sanctification of our souls, or to use the words of the Apostle Paul, as instruments of justice unto God. Usually we celebrate Christ the King Sunday after Thanksgiving, but this year it comes before. Hard to believe next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. This made me think about the first Thanksgiving and the reasons which motivated the pilgrims to make that perilous journey across the Atlantic Ocean and begin a new life in a strange land. The pilgrims, as we now call them, did not set sail from England. And I'll try to keep this history lesson short, but in this case, a little context might be helpful. The pilgrims had moved to the Netherlands in 1607 or 1608. At that time, most people called them Puritans because they wanted to purify the Church of England from many of its traditional practices. Basically, the Puritans thought that the Reformation in England had not gone far enough. So they tried to separate from the official state-sponsored Church of England, of which the king was, and in this case, Her Majesty the Queen is still the head of the church, and to form their own congregations. The problem was, this was against the law. At the time, all subjects of the crown were required to attend official worship services every Sunday and on high holy days. And if they didn't go, they had to pay a fine. And sometimes they were even jailed. The Puritans refused to follow the law and they had their own worship services in accordance with their own beliefs and interpretations. After years of paying fines, having their leaders imprisoned and many other forms of harassment, many Puritan groups groups began to leave England. The pilgrims, we remember at Thanksgiving, lived in in the Netherlands for about 13 years before finally, out of desperation, deciding to make the trip to what would later be known in 150 years as the United States. The reason I mention this today on Christ the King Sunday is not to retell the story of the first Thanksgiving of 1621, the first successful harvest after that very difficult year faced by the pilgrims, but rather I want to point out the difficulty they felt as people of faith trying to live in the real world Coming to America was not their first choice. Just imagine for a moment leaving behind your home, your community, your livelihood, and setting out with no guarantee of a better future. Of course, unlike many other people who came to these shores, the pilgrims did at least have a choice in the matter. But the point I am trying to make is that they struggled with what it meant to be a Christian in the day and age in which they lived. The pilgrims, before they left England, were torn between being loyal subjects of the king on one hand and faithful followers of Jesus on the other. The government was telling them that to be good patriotic members of society, they had to worship in a certain way and uphold a very specific set of beliefs and doctrines. But when they read the Bible and followed the example of Martin Luther and other reformers, they thought to themselves, There's more than one way to follow Jesus. Our conscience is telling us that the government, the King of England, can't dictate when and in what ways we worship and serve God. They had to choose between obedience to an earthly king or faithfulness to Christ. For people like us living in a representative democracy without a nobility or aristocracy, this is not a choice we have to struggle with. There are, however, many powerful forces and ideologies that demand our loyalty. We might not have to bow down and worship the emperor the way the people in the Roman Empire were expected to do once a year, but there are just as many influences which seek to supplant 
God's presence in our lives and to rule over us. During his earthly ministry, Jesus spoke about the inbreaking kingdom of God perhaps more than he spoke about anything else. Repent, he said, for the kingdom of God is at hand. One modern translation says, change your life. God's kingdom is here now. Jesus has invited all of humanity to change our way of thinking, to change our way of doing things, to turn away from the values and priorities of the world and to become a part of God's dominion, to value, prioritize, and most importantly, to do the things that are important to God. For whatever reason, it seems to me that the word agenda has taken on kind of a negative connotation. Maybe you've noticed that. <laughs> Whenever we talk about someone having an agenda, it's always, it's not usually good, right? <laughs> but agenda simply means a plan of things to be done or problems to be addressed. Through Jesus, God's agenda for the world, for the entire creation has been revealed. In his words and in his life, Jesus has revealed God's agenda of healing the sick, of feeding the hungry, welcoming strangers, forgiving sinners, caring for the vulnerable, working for justice, and renewing our hearts and minds for service to God. Unfortunately, this is not everyone's agenda. That's always been the case. It was the case during Jesus' time, Pilgrim's time and in our time. You might remember the film The Last Temptation of Christ, directed by Martin Scorsese, that came back, that was released back in 1988. It was very controversial um, when, it was, when it first came out. There's a great scene in the film where Jesus, who's played by Willem Dafoe, is talking to Pontius Pilate, played by the late, great David Bowie. I always thought he was underrated as an actor. But this is after Jesus has been arrested and Pilate is questioning him, trying to figure out who Jesus is. And he says to Jesus, do you know something? You're more dangerous than the zealots. You're more dangerous than the armed revolutionaries. Did you know that? And he asked Jesus to tell him what he preaches on the streets. And Jesus says, the prophet Daniel had a vision. A tall statue had a gold head silver shoulders, the stomach was bronze, the legs were iron, the feet were clay, a stone was thrown, the clay feet broke, the statue collapsed. Pilate gets impatient, yes, yes. And Jesus says, you see, God threw the stone. The stone is me. And, and then Jesus and Pilate both say at the same time, and Rome is the statue. Then Pilate sits down next to Jesus and says, you know, it's one thing to want to change the way people live, but you want to change how they think, how they feel. Jesus says, all I'm saying is that change will happen with love, not killing. And Pilate says, either way, it's dangerous. It's against Rome, and it's against the way the world is. And killing or loving, it's all the same. It simply doesn't matter how you want to change things, we don't want them changed. Isn't that the truth for some people? We don't want things changed. Even today, the powers opposed to the Jesus agenda don't want things to change. The powers that defy God's way would prefer for things to remain as they are, which is to say fallen and broken. Christ, our King, is inviting us and calling us to be co-workers in his kingdom, to bring about his dominion in this place through our words and deeds as individual Christians and collectively as the body of Christ. When talking about the words, your kingdom come in the Lord's prayer, Martin Luther said that God's kingdom comes on its own, whether or not we do anything about it. But in this prayer that we ask, it may come among us and by us. Frank Thomas, a professor of Christian, uh, at the Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis, recently wrote about today's gospel story in Christian Century Magazine. And he said, 
the kingdom of God is under divine sovereignty. Ultimately, the reign of God is God's government set up in the human heart. God comes into the human heart at the point of regeneration and makes that heart a holy habitation. God's government invades the human heart such that God's authority is established in a person's mind and will. When God occupies a human heart, then the kingdom has come to earth. When God sets up government in a human heart, then peace shall reign. When God sets up government in a human heart, then we shall beat our swords into plowshares. When God sets up government in enough human hearts, then we shall study war no more. How is God using you to bring about the kingdom? How is God working through us, this congregation called Good Shepherd, fully funded and ready to go, at least in terms of approving the budget for another year, <laughs> to testify and to serve one another in the name of Jesus, our King? He has called each one of us to be part of this important work. I wish you all a very blessed Thanksgiving, and may God bless you all. Amen.